Yeah, I have some theories about the, the future of, of remote sales. As a salesperson, who is actually your audience? Mm. It's a great question. Yeah, and I think... Beyond the sales side of things, maybe it's not their passion to keep selling. What is a good transition? I think sales is a great vehicle, but I think for a lot of people, if you ask them and said, you know, how much would it take for me to pay you and you never do sales again? I think everybody yeah. has a number or most people have a number. <laughs> what about you, JD? What, where, where do you source your inspiration? At? Yeah, so, I mean, I... Uh, just generally speaking, how's how's things going? Uh, for Fantastic. You yeah, lots lots happening. Uh, we're getting ramped up for the launch of UCM 4.0, uh, really changing the direction of, of kind of expanding our offering to be able to serve more people and have a positive impact in more areas than just the traditional land a job and, and learn how to sell. That's cool. So That's really super cool. Super excited about that. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. What's uh, some of the things that you're finding, uh, I guess, that's causing the shift maybe or uh, what's what's pulling you in that direction? Just feedback, honestly. You know, I'm very connected to my community and always talking to people. And one thing we found is from novice to competent, right, then the skill development in the job makes a big difference. And mm, you can two yeah. to three X your income by improving your skill, especially when you're starting out, right? And then you get to a certain point and it becomes harder and harder to see that same return going down that same avenue. But a lot of salespeople get that tunnel vision and they just invest in more sales training, invest in more sales training and just keep going down that road. And there's obviously there's more return than just the financial side, but yes. it gets more and more difficult to see those same returns. Right. And mm. so what we've looked at are what are the peak income strategies? Of course, you want to continue to improve, but what actually moves the needle? Not what we've been told move the needle, not what people are saying, but what actually like, let's look at the case studies. Let's look at the top earners and say, what were the pieces? Because it's, mm. again, easy to say once you get to the top and you create a training, what got you there. But let's yeah, look yeah. at it along the way and let's look at the data and take the emotion out of it and see where the biggest earning jumps have been. And we found some interesting things. Um, and also understanding when I came in and, and it's been this way for seven, eight years, everybody's selling this 1% mm. dream and top of the leaderboard. Yes. Most of the people that I talk to don't give a shit about top 1% or top leaderboard. They're looking at retirement age. They're looking at finances. They're looking at lifestyle. They're looking at how much time versus how much money. How can I get more time back? Mm. And how can I get more yes. money out? Um, obviously with my integrity and morals and all those things, but there's a new audience coming in that doesn't care what percentage they are or you know, if they're on the top or the mid, as long as the money makes sense, the lifestyle makes sense. So yes. what I've started to do is look at how we can kind of bypass that linear approach of, okay, I come in, I get a job, it's maybe a DM setting and then setting and then closing and then 10K and then 15K and then 20K and then 30K. It's a very linear approach. And what mm. I've found is there's a way to kind of spread that out where you can bypass a lot of those kind of granular um jumps yeah nice yeah. nice it, it, what are some of the things i guess maybe qualities of people that uh, you find can make those different jumps is there is there a difference or is it something that they kind of develop over time or just people have it for no for sure i mean i think there's definitely qualities that that speed up the process i think again it, it's someone who for me it's the observation so someone mm. who can observe and kind of pick out the difference between what they're being told and just ask themselves. I think oftentimes when you get into this, you just assume that that's the next thing and the next thing. And in talking to students, just asking the right questions. Now I can do this, but you can also do this for yourself of like, mm. is my life going to be wildly different from 10 to 12 K a month? Is that going to make a huge difference? If not, what am I going to have to allocate to get that extra 2K? And wouldn't that be better off looking at the next biggest bump, the one that would actually have a different quality of life? 
you know, whether mm-hmm. it's 25 or 30 or more time yes. back, but really that lifestyle design first. So I think it takes a level of kind of, I wouldn't say thought leadership, but observation and really mm-hmm. kind of realigning and being able to be reflective and aware what is actually fueling this journey right now. Like, why am I doing this? And why is this important to me? Because if we can get the destination without having to go down the linear approach, Mm. um, it speeds things up. And it definitely sped things up for me. And I wish, these are things that I learned along the way that I wish I learned much earlier that when I was at 15 or 20 or 25K a month, looking back now, I should have been looking at five years, 10 years ahead instead of looking at how can I get to 30, I didn't see Mm. any difference between 25 (laughs) and 30 K between 30 and 35, between 35 and 40. And I was always kind of let down with the feeling of accomplishment. I always thought that next milestone would really get it. And then it's, you know, two minute celebration and then back to it. And so I, I think people need to just take some time to reflect on what this is really for. And is there a better way to get there? Mm, very that interesting. To me, yeah, that to me is the most important part. And then just being able to challenge and kind of look outside. I think this little bubble that we get into <laughs> is very much, um, it's very limiting. And mm. so being able to look outside and say, what are wealth principles? Right. If wealth is important yes. to me, if health is important to me, if happiness is important to me, and if I'm only limited to the people in this little bubble of remote sales or sales, I'm very limited, I'm very mm. limited. Yes. And there's, I'm more likely to going, going to experience a lot of these biases and a lot of incentivized teachings, right? Which people are incentivized to tell you what leads them to you. And I get that. Yeah. Right? But... <laughs> Being able to go outside of that and look at the principles, look at success principles, look at wealth principles and understanding the game and then figuring out and taking that big picture and applying it to sales as a vehicle rather than, you know, sales as a lifetime, I have to get to the very top. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really interesting that you mentioned that, um, you know, I, I guess the different ways of thinking and maybe a lot of people being in the bubble. Uh, I've been talking to quite a, quite a lot of people and one of the things that uh, we've been talking about is like ideas outside of the sales environment right. around the sales space and um, it's usually salespeople I find tend to crowd around other salespeople and they're, okay. they're limited yeah. by, by what they can think about though, right? So, right. Um, but just to go back, I guess uh, I had a question before when I came in, I never really heard about, and, and I came into this space in 2019. Um, I never really heard about the 10K thing, but being in it now, it's all I hear. Like, where, where do you, when I mean, you've been in the high ticket space uh, for for a lot longer, where, where do you think this 10K milestone goes? Is it like this magical thing that uh, people get sold to dream of? Is this like a purely a marketing thing, or where, where yeah, do you think, think- it originated from? I think it's a little bit of both. I think it all starts with marketing for sure. And when I, when I started in this industry, there was maybe one or two offers in this space Mm -hmm. that, you know, you could go with, and now there's hundreds and hundreds. Yeah. So you're seeing it all the time. And I I think it's an easy number to wrap people's head around and it kind of rounds up and they want six figures. Well, six figures is around (laughs) 18 months. Well, 10 K just round up and that's the number. Uh, But, the, the challenge that I'm seeing now, and I've been working with a lot of students more on this and really diving in and kind of criticizing and, and not in the way of, you know, ripping them apart, but ripping the idea apart and saying what's left. And so, you know, this 10K, what does that lifestyle look like? Right. What does it actually look like? What do you do? How do you spend it? How much do you save? Right. How long does that get you to retirement? When, mm-hmm. what day do you retire? Right. And what you realize is there's nothing behind it. Right. And so Mm. it's okay to have those kind of targets, but what for? And what I found is it becomes this kind of weight for people and they make suboptimal decisions in the pursuit of a goal that they don't, they're not connected to. And so what we do is just kind of understand first, like, why is that 10K? What does that mean? Right. And so 
So uh, kind of an exercise that I take students through that I think is really important is this idea from things can't stay pipe dreams. So if you tell me you want to retire at 45 or you tell me your dream vacation is go to Japan and I ask you, okay, how much do you need to retire at 45? Or, you know, what would the whole cost to Japan cost? Hmm. They don't know. And like, well, that's a pipe dream, right? And pipe dreams stay pipe dreams. So what we have to do is move it over as quickly as possible into the details, right? What are the hotels cost and what does this cost and how much do you need and what is the lifestyle there and start breaking those things down. And then all of a sudden there starts to be meaning to it. And then you start to see the opportunities and understanding that that's what's really important. Right? Mm. The retirement, the time with your kids, what place you are on the leaderboard doesn't really matter. And I've had people that reach out and they're like, I'm struggling to stay on top of the leaderboard. We run the numbers and I'm like, well, why do you need to stay on top of the leaderboard? <laughs> and we realize that, okay, if I'm second or third on the leaderboard, right, I'm still making 27K or 23K instead of 30. I have 15 hours more with my wife or my kids. Yeah. I, I get to work out, I get to do this, I get to eat, I get to have fun, right? Like, and I don't notice a difference between 27 and 30. Hmm. Right? And so yeah. we're sold this idea because it keeps the machine going. And hmm. we're, we're made insecure about this and that, and that gets us buying more, right? Marketers know what they're doing. They know how to touch, push the buttons and make you feel insecure and that you're not good enough and that it's, you yeah. know, a hyper competitive world. And if you don't, do this or train that, then you're, you're going to die or you're going to be killed by your competition. And I've never seen any of those things. I've been in this industry for a long time and and sales for 17 years and no one getting better has ever taken food off my table. There's an abundance of opportunities and and it's continuing to evolve beyond that too. That sales Mm. plus that we're focusing on UCM, that's where the opportunity is. Um, People won't be able to compete with, they're just skills in time. You can't, it's very limited. There's a ceiling in which you can just leverage skill in time. And we understand yeah, this. Yeah, run out of it. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. It's, it's yeah. both scarce resources and the plateaus that you get, like you said, you might be able to get two to three X better, but then do it again and then do it again mm. and do it again. And, and the ability where skill is going to be a highly leverageable financial tool has a ceiling and everybody who understands wealth understands that. Yeah, for sure. And also, uh, you know, you're at kind of at the mercy of the offer owners or whatever offer vehicle that you, you get into, right. right? Um, which is, which is also interesting. Um, I was looking back at, uh, my feed and people commenting from, I was trying to find a post from like a couple of years ago and I was, I was scrolling back and I, and I saw a lot of, um, salespeople, uh, commenting on some of the stuff and they're still still around to this date. And then I noticed some coaches from way back commenting and kind of not there anymore. So I started having a look at, at, at a few. And um, I guess my thesis is that the sales reps in the space have better longevity than business owners themselves, yeah. um, you know, sort of along the way. I've just, I've just seen a lot of... Um, yeah, offers come and come and go, and, and when I say go, like they just disappear uh, in, into nothingness. Uh, where, where do you think this year, twenty twenty four? Where's the opportunity? Is there an opportunity, um, you know, for for people to, uh, you know, help off owners a lot better? Or uh, do you feel like, you know, as we've we've had that the the big surge of uh, offers entering, you know, the marketplace? you think it's going to continue or kind of plateau a little bit from here? Yeah, I have some theories about the the future of, of remote sales. Um, mm. And I think, I think what's going to happen is, and we've already kind of seen this, is there will be a bit of a gap that's created. And whenever there's disruption, that seems to be what happens. The people that adapt yeah. and adopt early and then the people yeah. who kind of drag behind. I think on my end, from the sales perspective, what I'm seeing is there's, Certain online marketers that have just, you know, flush a ton of people into this industry. And so it is flooded, but like Mm. anything, it floods at the bottom. So what I'm seeing is there's a large amount of people that need security and they need safety and they need, you know, they just want a paycheck. 
And that's the first time I've ever seen this at volume here where people are really uncomfortable and they, they kind of want just the nine to five in remote mm. sales and they're willing yeah. to give up opportunity and they're willing to give up potential. I've never seen that before. And I think that mm. that just goes to poor marketing, just introducing people. And now they, they don't know what to do and they don't know where to go. And I think yeah. anytime there is someone that's willing to take comfort and certainty, there will be someone entrepreneurial to, to take that opportunity. And I don't yes. think that's evil or bad. I just think that we've already seen that over the last, you know, I've been in remote sales for about eight years now, seven and a half. And I've yeah. already seen that incline where the people in the middle take those opportunities, right? Yes. They turn it into something more comfortable and they, they pass it down. I think we'll continue to yeah. see that. And my prediction is we'll even see that more in the closing realm where some people will realize like this person just wants to make 5k and comfort and all of these things. Yeah. I'll package it up in a nice bow and give it to them. <laughs> um, and smaller per percentages of commissions. When I started 15% was standard uh, mm. for closers, 10% for setters. And that's continually been going down. So I think yes. you'll see that as, yeah, you know, okay. the digital rat race and, and nine to five, but remote, I think you'll see that expand because opportunistic entrepreneurial types, We'll see that yeah. where I'm seeing the opportunity and we're, you know, looking out, not based on what we're told, but what we're seeing right, is the sales plus and sales as a service and mm. being able to establish yourself as I'm not talking about so much the LLC or the business, but operating as a business and looking mm -hmm. for partnerships and looking for strategic alliances and looking to be able to expand your services and your impact. And as you develop in this sales realm, right, you can continue to develop your sales skills, obviously. Yeah. But what I found is if you can spend some time developing your sales skills and the others expanding your skills and your knowledge and your wisdom and your ability to help other aspects of the sales process, rather than just be the closer or the, just be the setter, looking at the plus. That's mm -hmm. where I see the opportunity going. I see the hybrid business opportunities and I see uh, that's where a lot more of the authority is going. That's where a lot more of the value is going. Someone mm -hmm. who can take ownership over different aspects. And I'm not just talking about full stack either. I'm not just talking about setting yeah. and closing and all of these things together, but I'm talking about taking that wisdom, that expertise and even things outside right? Things yeah. outside and things that you do well that are outside of the sales process and, yes. and showing up as a partner within that business and expanding your own. That's, that's where I see the opportunity in the future. It's, For um, sure. And that's where we'll see the top earners. And we already have seen that, right? You, as you know, people talk a lot of shit about business owners and their <laughs> offers when they're making 30 K a month, but yeah. that's a dream income for a closer. And so mm. when you just think about that, just logically, a, an offer that we wouldn't want to work with or that, you know, most, most closers would turn their nose to Local that's, yeah. a, that's a great income. So, you yeah. know, a good closer salary is, you know, a, a startup business. And, and that just goes to show the opportunity beyond just skill and time. Skill just and just time. A, yeah, for sure. I a hundred percent would agree with that. Um, I'd, I'd spent probably the best part of last year just putting some, some crazy things together. Uh, mm. just to either prove things or uh, kind of move away from, you know, from right. where, where people end up being in a grind, um, getting out of nine to five and getting into, like you said, you know, the remote grind, it's, it's, right. it's not that much different, right? Um, just different places. But I think um, just on the, I guess, the business of being sales as a service, uh, I think mm. it's a really cool concept. Where do you find it? And, and, and I'm starting to see this uh, a lot more now where where the the personal branding uh of entrepreneurs but not just entrepreneurs service providers like right. salespeople are starting to come out uh where do you see that kind of play the role and how would somebody stand out to be a little bit different in the sea of marketers and salespeople do you know as far as personal brand is concerned what would what would make the difference because I, one thing that i i also see is that most personal brands and in, in the sales space kind of talk about the same thing, you yeah. know, how yeah. do you be different? 
Yeah, I think I think you have to, and we're dealing with this right now, where we're dealing with, you know, a bunch of people with conflicting uh, viewpoints, and then you have incentivized mm-hmm. teachings of, you know, if it doesn't benefit the person selling the program, then they tell you the the networking and the branding and all of those things don't matter, but mm-hmm. they're also telling you that thing through their branding and through their networking, right? If someone posts about branding not being important, they're using the elements of branding, right? It's, it's all there. Yeah. And so what I think, and, and, you know, I've had a pretty unique experience going through in that I've, I've been a setter, I've been a closer, I've been a recruiter, I've, I've mm. been a business owner, I've been a mentor of salespeople, and I've had those students go on to do businesses. So I've kind of seen it from a lot of different angles. Yeah. And you have to be very good at one, cutting the fat, and being able to understand where those incentives are coming from and know that I think a big thing for personal brand is it taps into our natural desire to be liked. And I think you have to do the opposite in that part of my personal brand is to repel the people Mm. who I don't want in that tribe. Yes. You know, part of it is to draw that line in the sand and say, these are the people that I want. These are the people I want to interact with. These are the values that I want to showcase and being able to build that community. And in doing so, right, it's almost like in sales, right? Your job is to disqualify as much as it is to qualify. And I think the natural tendency for most people is to want to qualify and want to get the set and want to get the dopamine rush of getting the next thing. But, you know, being able to disqualify and being able to create some of that, you know, down the line is really important. And we see this all the time in some of the top brands in the space. I think Mm. for me, the biggest thing that I see people struggling with is thought leadership. And again, like you said, it's kind of the same things Uh, for me, where I've been able to have the most success is going outside of sales and drawing inspiration from things that have nothing to do. And this has been the best sales training that's, that's ever happened to me. Right. It's doing things like personal development and learning about human behavior and child psychology and different factors and decision making and scientific decision making and communication outside of the sales realm. And that's given me an abundance of new information and things that I can draw in. And it's made me a better salesperson. It's made me a better leader. And I think we need to kind of burst the bubble a little bit and not look at this as remote sales but look at this as just business and life and career and yeah. draw yeah. from inspirations and kind of open up the gene pool a little bit and kind of get some <laughs> fresh water in and be willing to learn and read books that don't have anything to do with sales and listen to people and listen to podcasts. We're so obsessed with mm. the few elements of tonality and objection handling and this and that, and do we pre-close or do we post-close? And it, it's just this battle And what I've seen is this works, that works, that works. They all work, right? Everybody that's telling you their way works, I've seen them be successful. So great. Any of those work, let's move on, right? What what do you align with? Now let's bring something new to it, right? Where do you draw your inspiration in? And and never forgetting about the personal side of personal branding. It is you amplified and and highlighted. I think that's really important. Man, that's a really good point. So I think, um, yeah, a lot of that that stuff that you mentioned, uh, yeah, I, I very much uh, align with and resonate with, especially drawing inspiration from outside. Um, mm. I, I never wanted to be in any sort of bubble, but the and the and the further you you expand these things, just you know, your bubble gets bigger and bigger, right? Um, right. And it allows for for better learning. So uh, some good points in there, like in terms of personal branding, I think the the part that you mentioned about repelling you know, or qualifying, disqualifying uh, from a sales perspective uh, in terms of your personal brand, I think is is not done enough uh, because of, you know, the feeling of being liked or if you put something out and people don't like it and how do you deal with that? Uh, the ironic thing is salespeople are typically pretty good at, well, should be pretty good at rejection anyway, right? Um, it's just it's just in a different, uh, you know, different format as far as the, yeah, the personal brand is concerned where, you know, from, from that perspective, then let's say you are repelling uh, or, or, or attracting the right, the right type of person as a, as a salesperson, like 
who is actually your audience, do you think? It's a great question. Yeah, and I think, I think it's going to be different for each person. I think a lot of people get confused and they kind of join a camp and then they think everybody in that camp is, is their, is their audience. And I think yeah. there's one aspect of it, right? But understanding that the groups that you join are whoever owns that group, whoever created that group, it's their audience, it's yes. their audience. They built it for them. So you have to ask, do you have similar goals to that person? So mm. I think salespeople are in a unique spot in that obviously business owners, are one aspect, right? If we're, if we're looking yeah. for jobs, if we're looking for opportunities, yes. if we're looking for strategic partnerships, I think we need yeah. to do more in the business realm. I think mm. we join people start out. And again, I understand where, when you're starting, you got to start somewhere, right? They start out and they just mm. type in a few keywords or they're told about a group and they join that group and then yeah. they never, never leave. Mm. Right? And I appreciate it if it's my group, you know, but <laughs> also, even though it's my group venture out, right? This yes. is my audience. I talk to salespeople. These are your colleagues and, and the people that you want to build these careers with. That's fantastic, right? And I think salespeople connecting with salespeople and not kind of having that dog eat dog mm. mentality, I think is really important because yes. what we're seeing in UCM is the collaboration is, is much more powerful than, you know, the individual sport. And we see this in, in job offers and we see this in opportunities and we see this in growth. And then we see, see this later on. And a lot of these people are strategically partnered, right? So, yeah. you know, sales Agreed. people that went, started together will also eventually build businesses together and things like that. So mm. I think there's something to be said about strategic alliances, but you need to be mindful. And how I kind of describe it is you want to look for what I call rising stars and top performers. So a rising star is someone that has all the ingredients, but they're missing time. They just started. So. Yeah. But yes. you and I both know there's people that you meet and you're like, that person will be successful no matter what. Yeah, right? pretty obvious. So yeah. those are the people. I think that being able to network with those and, and making the climb with those people, kind of your class, right? If you're thinking of mm. alumni, those are the class. So yeah. gravitating yeah. towards those people, right? Like when I first started or, or maybe a couple of years in, Right. Like one of the first people I worked with was Sean Ray. Right. And so mm. we've kind of yeah, came nice. up together, even though we went on different campaigns and, and went in different paths. It's kind of cool to see that growth and, and be able to yeah. connect. And if he needs something, he can always reach out to me and vice versa. Right. And so and when I met Sean, I'm like, there's no doubt that this person is going to be highly successful in this space. Mm. Right. And I'm, I'm sure he thought the same thing about me. Right. And we we climbed the leaderboard of the campaign together and, and went on to do great things. Right. And so yeah. I think. That's it's awesome. really important to kind of identify those people and then obviously top performers and look at a model, but then looking at outside of this space, right? Who are the great marketers? Who are the great mm. uh, deliverables? You know, who are the great coaches? Who are the great entrepreneurs? Who are the great speakers? Um, and then who are the rising stars? So I always kind of think in that category because I want to see like, who can I invest in early that's going to yes. continue to rise? And then, how can I kind of build that network of, of top performers? Yeah, for sure. For sure. I, I think there's, there's some really cool things to come out of that because um, oftentimes when, especially when you are trying to, to grow, you, you tend to find the people like a few steps beforehand right. where, you know, some of the goals are going to be coming up with the, maybe the enthusiasm that you'll learn from somebody who's just trying to make it out uh, to, to where your level is. Right. So I think that's really cool. Um, I've, I've had the privilege of, working with some UCM folks and from other programs as well. Um, I, I find that probably a common common trait with all of the ones, you know, that I've had really good dealings with uh, is they are quite open to whatever it is, right? Suggestion, feedback, whatever you, whatever you call it. And, and there, there's a constant, uh, constant mindset of learning, you know, sort of along, along the way. Um, I guess to to where you're leading with uh, UCM 4.0, beyond the sales side of things, when people have uh, have got the skill, but they don't necessarily want to. Maybe it's not their passion to keep selling. Right. Like, what is a good transition, or what's a maybe a sub skill set, or or or, or a, a sideways movement to that if they don't want to get involved in sales? Yeah, I think. 
I think sales is a great vehicle, but I think for a lot of people, if you ask them and said, you know, how much would it take for me to pay you and you never do sales again? I think everybody yeah. has a number or most people have numbers. <laughs> there's, there's a few diehards. And again, that's not, my group is not the, you know, sales bro for life and, and, you know, kill or be killed. Mine is lifestyle. I want the best lifestyle mm. for me and my family. I want freedom. Yeah. I want to, to have the things that I want and be able to live that life and, and whatever gets me there. If there was something better, I'd take that vehicle, right? How do I sure. optimize this opportunity, but not stay a day longer than I have to. Then you have to. I, yeah. My goal was always five years in remote sales and then be done. Now I went mm. on and, you know, stupidly came back and, <laughs> and, you know, but that's more of a passion project and, and a sense of yes. purpose, but how can I condense this as quickly as possible? And so, you know, there's, there's kind of sub skills as far as leverage, but I also want to challenge people to stop thinking about skills, mm. right? It's, you know, time and skill. Sometimes what we find, and I, I fell into this trap myself is, okay, I, I don't want to be employed, right? I want to be business. And you got to ask yourself, are you a business or are you self-employed? And I think there's a big difference, right? If we're thinking about yes. those kind of cash flow quadrants, I think a lot yes. of people, if you went and talked to any salesperson right now and said, okay, start a business, just naturally comfort was they're going to take the skills they've learned and they're going yes. to leverage their time and they're going to do the same thing, right? And then eventually they're going to hit a maximum on that and it might be a higher maximum, right? But then the ceiling's going to be there and they're going to have to figure it out. So what I would say is, one, as far as skills go, I think the most important skill that you can have is decision making. And I think we should constantly be pushing this. And, and I think mentors and trainers should be focused on helping their people make better decisions because that, yes. you know, as sales changes your scripts or your sales process or the way we handle objections or the way we speak to people, uh, that's always going to change and that's always going to mm. adjust. And, and, you know, I've, I've seen the adjustments along the way and someone new is going to come out and that's going to be the new way. Uh, that's always going to change. Yeah. But your ability to make more optimal decisions in your life, that's not an area of your life that you won't improve if you consistently make better decisions, right? Your yeah. problem solving, your resourcefulness. So I would say those core fundamental skills, because as you go into management or leadership or start an Amazon store or an affiliate business or invest, Guess what? It's all decisions. And so I think decision making, problem solving, resourcefulness and leveraging resources and kind of planning and prioritizing. I think those are all core skills that I'm teaching that have kind of the biggest impact because it makes yeah. people more independent and they can they don't have to be, you know, what do I say when um, type mm. of thing. So I think yeah. that at its core um, and yeah. then interesting, I think you have to look at your personality and you have to look at kind of the milestones and what is the lifestyle. So for example, if going back, if I got up to 10 or 15 K a month, I probably would have stopped trying to scale that maybe around 15, 15, 20, something like that. I probably would have stopped trying to scale my sales income and yeah. I would have focused on cutting my time back and focused on business. And yes, especially business that led to, you know, limited amounts of time, right. Or leadership. I think leadership is something that's very lacking and, and everybody's talking about the, the rise of AI and all of these things. I think leadership <laughs> is going to be one of the hardest skills and, and kind of the longest lap lasting. And I think there's a big need for that. So leadership skills, being able to influence and, and help other people, I think is going to yeah. be big. Um, and then just, being able to to kind of flex those CEO muscles and mm. not always revert back to time and skill as your only source of of income, and that's that's uncomfortable yeah. for people and it's difficult. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, hundred percent. I I would agree with that. And some people are just built for it. Some people they have to work, you know, sort of work towards it. Um, right. I guess it's a it's a constant evolution that that everyone goes through if they you know if they want to keep going in that way, and that could evolve to, you know, to more, more, uh, more things, or it could evolve to less things, but more of maybe lifestyle and things like that as well. So, exactly. yeah. Um, and I think it's important more. with, with the idea of what I've seen is people have these false peaks and they, it's a linear approach. They get to the top of the mountain. They think it's going to be it. And then there's like, Oh, there's another one. Right. Oh, so 
I'm not for anybody that's listening that it, that's in sales right now and making that climb. I'm certainly not saying devote a hundred percent to business, to wealth creation, to things outside of the sales realm, but I'm certainly not saying devote zero percent either. Mm. And so what I'm saying is, and we understand this, right? You can't tell your spouse like, okay, I'm, I'm going to hit 10 K and I'll be back in two years. Right. We have to balance eating and sleeping and all of these things. But for some reason, we get a very singular focus when it comes to making money. There's one way. And once I hit this amount, then I'll start that. And mm -hmm. what I found is being able to spread that out and develop your sales skills and, and develop the, the chance to get better opportunities, of course. But let's open that space up and let's look at one. How can we move from earnings to profit? And then how can we move from profit to return? And even yeah. if that's you know, 2% of your time, right? Think of it like an investment. If you start that compounding interest and you take, okay, here's a hundred percent of my time, I'm going to start investing one or 2% for the next five years or 10 years. You might not have the money to invest, but time is a resource. Yeah, so 100%. take that 5%, take that 2% and put it in the bank, you know, start mm. investing it and exploring the future. And I think that's, that, that will be very helpful it's that when you do hit those peaks, right, all of a sudden it's not, okay, time to start again or, or back to the drawing board. It's, oh, I've already had these things building. Already had it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I think that's, yeah, that, that's super important to, to, to do that. The, the time concept, investing your time, I think it's, it's not, maybe not as sexy as money, but uh, yeah. it's definitely, I think, more valuable. Um, what about you, JD? What's um, someone like yourself been here? been in the game for a while where where do you source your inspiration and maybe what are some of the things that that you're looking to learn now as you're as you continue to progress yourself yeah so i mean i i originally started by just really wanting to understand myself and i found that that the more i understood myself the more i see myself in the prospect the more i was able to kind of mm -hmm. figure out things that most people couldn't see and, and kind of go underneath. So what's inspiring me right now is um, on the sales side, I would say the, the situational selling, you know, mm. being able to expand our ability to influence and not force prospects to go through our process, but be able to have a standard process, but be able to adjust to that mm. and take yeah. all these different methodologies and be able to turn them into kind of a tool or a spice that we could use yeah. a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Uh, I think nice. every methodology has its limitations. And so being able yeah. to sell situationally um, from that side. And then I'm looking at, you know, what is this next level of, of people coming up and how can we make sales as a service and how can we add this sales plus and, and how can we fight for the opportunities in this space and also expand, right? We don't mm. know what the future holds. So how can we make better decisions? And so I'm looking at, Again, I spend a lot of time outside of this bubble. Mm, I, I yeah. always have my finger on the pulse. I talk to students a lot, but when I'm done my day, I don't listen to more sales training or, <laughs> or what the people are doing. You know, I've heard enough and I, it hasn't yeah. really changed. What people are saying now hasn't really changed same. in seven years. It's all the same on repeat, yeah. but just a new face. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at what the speakers are saying and what people are saying at the events and, and listening to Ted talks and, and, mm you know, this thought leadership of people that can change the world. That, that to me is most interesting. And then That's some cool. of the, the old, old school of, you know, people who has, have said things hundred years ago that, that held up and mm. that's really interesting to me and kind of weighing that's it cool. out, right? Looking at kind of futuristic and history and kind of comparing them, but yeah, you can draw inspiration from anything, but I'm really excited about the future. And I think it's going to create disruption creates opportunity for, for those willing to adapt. And, yeah. you know, I, I want to make sure that everybody in, in our organization and our community is able to adapt and able to ride this wave and take, take the opportunities that come with it, but get ahead of it. 